topic this morning, but the songs are absolutely right on target. 100% on, on, on target. So good to be with you. And um, if you will turn in your Bibles to Psalm 42, Psalm 42. Anybody? Is this a favorite of anybody's? As the deer panteth for the waters, so my soul panteth after you. When you get it, if you would stand up, we're going to read right through it. It is so good to be in the house of the Lord. Amen? We are going to read through the whole thing and then I'll have you be seated and we'll just come back to the first four verses. Ready? As the deer pants for streams of water, so my soul pants for you, O God. My soul thirsts for God, for the living God. When can I go and meet with God? My tears have been my food day and night while men say to me all day long, where is your God? These things I remember as I pour out my soul, how I used to go with the multitude leading the procession to the house of God with shouts of joy and thanksgiving among the festive throng. Why are you downcast, O my soul? Why so disturbed within me? Put your hope in God, for I will yet praise him, my Savior and my God. My soul is downcast within me, therefore I will remember you. From the land of the Jordan, the heights of Hermon, from Mount Mazar, deep calls to deep in the roar of your waterfalls. All your waves and breakers have swept over me. By day, the Lord directs his love. At night, his song is with me, a prayer to the God of my life. I say to God my rock, why have you forgotten me? Why must I go about mourning, oppressed by the enemy? My bones suffer mortal agony as my foes taunt me, saying to me all day long, where is your God? Why are you downcast, O my soul? Why so disturbed within me? Put your hope in God, for I will yet praise him, my Savior and my God. This is the word of the Lord. Amen. You can be seated. I want to look particularly at the beginning of this, at the first four verses, because the first four, four verses set the tone of this, and I don't know what you heard as we read through all of that, but clearly the psalmist has some angst. The psalmist here, as he's writing, he has some concerns. He has some deep feelings. He has some issues. Maybe you do too. I know I do. I've got more issues than you want to know about. But let's, let's look at, remember, the psalms were meant to be sung, and the psalms are Hebrew poetry. And so there's imagery in this poetry, and particularly in the setting of these first four verses. Listen to this. As the deer pants for water, so my soul thirsts for you. When I studied English, they called that a simile. This thing is like this thing. As the deer pants for water, so my soul thirsts for you. Two different images, two different applications. I have to ask you this question, why would a deer pant for water? Any hunters in here? A deer would pant for water because they're thirsty, but why would a deer be thirsty? Either it is a condition of drought, or the deer is being chased as the prey of some animal. And the deer, how many of you have ever seen deer run through the woods? I'll tell you what, they come and go pretty quickly. But listen, listen and get a hold of the thought 
the deer is in trouble one way or another. And the deer desperately needs water. And if they're being chased, they can't stop and drink water. They're being chased. They're being harassed. And they're on the run. And as they're on the run, here's what they know. I desperately need water quickly or I am going to be caught. As the deer panteth for water. There's a a desperation here. Listen to the psalmist. In the same way that a deer being chased is desirous on the inside for water, that is my desire for God. That is where I am as I am writing this psalm to sing. I need God desperately or I will be captured. That's the introduction. Now listen. And the title today, and you'll see it in the next verse, the title today is A Thirsty Soul. Not a thirsty body. Not a thirst that can be quenched with a drink. But a thirsty soul. Look at verse 2. My soul thirsts for God. For the living God. When can I go and meet with God? The deer is running. When can I get water? The psalmist's soul is thirsting. When can I meet with God? How can I get together with God? Have you ever felt that way? You don't need to raise your hand. Have you ever felt like, I can't take it anymore? How? When can I get together with God? That's a thirsty soul. That's a soul that's thirsting for the right thing. That's a soul that, if you will allow me, does not have its own solution to the problem. That's a soul that knows God is the solution to the problem. A thirsty soul. Listen to this. My tears have been my food day and night. Now, The psalmist doesn't say what his circumstances are, but listen to the words. My tears have been my food day and night. I have a question. How nourishing is that? For your tears to be your food. In other words, the psalmist is in a period of time where for repeated days they are weeping. They are yearning for something day and night. And men are taunting them. While men say to me all day long, where is your God? I'll tell you, how how often is this sometimes the situation we hate to be in? We testify that we are followers of Christ, and yet we go through periods of time where tears are our food, night and day. And inevitably, when we go through those times, someone will say to us, where's the God in whom you boast? Where is that God that you boasted about? Where is that God that you praised? That's exactly what the psalmist is saying. Now listen, verse 4. These things I remember as I pour out my soul, how I used to go with the multitude, leading the procession to the house of God with shouts of joy and thanksgiving among the festive crowd. So now... The psalmist is looking beyond his immediate circumstances. And he's looking back to a better time. And he's yearning for something. As he pours out his heart to God, he's remembering the joy of being with a multitude of people who were worshiping God and him as one of the leaders leading them to the throne room of God. But it's inescapable that at the moment, this man has a thirsty soul. The theme of thirst, of water, of living water, Jesus tells us he is the living water, of the fact that Jesus connects living water in the New Testament with the giving of the Spirit of God, all of these, this is all one theme in the Bible. It's a consistently recurring theme in both the Old and the New Testament. And the whole purpose of this theme, 
The idea of a dry and weary land where there is no water. The idea of a thirst and a hunger that God invites us to Him to satisfy. The purpose for these ongoing things, themes, Old and New Testament, is that they speak to us of the hope of salvation in God. Not a bad thing to be thirsty. Amen, Pastor Peter. It's not a bad thing to be thirsty. It's not a bad thing to have trouble. It's not a bad thing to have dry periods of time. It's not a bad thing to wake up and become discouraged when you look at the world around you. None of those things are bad things. I'm going to tell you, they are actually the story of man. And the reason that they're not bad things is God has designed the world of believers to be such that what we find in the world and what we fill ourselves with in the world will never satisfy us. That's God's design. Because God has reserved for himself the right, the privilege, and the gift of being the one and only who can satisfy what we truly need. So I'm saying to you again today, how thirsty is your soul today, right now? When I started to go down this road um, three weeks ago, we talked about Isaiah 55, verses 1 and 2. All right? I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to repeat them a little bit. If you remember we talked about the fact that Isaiah is giving the people who are thirsty an invitation. And I'll just, I'll read those two verses to you because three weeks ago we talked about invitation and then last week Jonathan Brown did a, did a great job because uh, I couldn't preach that day and uh, he picked up right where I left, was going to leave off in John chapter 4 and what was John chapter 4 about? John chapter 4 was about the woman at the well. Okay. And uh, let me talk to you about Isaiah first. Isaiah 55, 1 and 2. Listen to the invitation all over again. Come, all you who are thirsty, come to the waters. And you who have no money, come, buy, and eat. Come, buy wine and milk without money and without cost. In other words, what God has to give us, you can't buy. Okay? The invitation is the coin. Your response to his invitation gives you the ability to receive. If you don't respond to the invitation, you will not have the opportunity to receive. It's an invitation, God coming to us, that we must embrace and say, oh, this is what I need. Why spend money on what is not bread and your labor on what does not satisfy? Listen to me and eat what is good, and your soul will delight in the riches of fair. Those are just the first two verses. I mean, when you read that, when I read it, why spend money on what's not bread and your labor on what does not satisfy? You know what it says to me? It says to me, why, Peter, would you foolishly continue to pursue spending what you've earned and laboring harder for things you think will satisfy, but which will not satisfy? That's a great question. Great question. Or in Matthew eleven twenty eight, 28, you can just listen to me. You've heard this one. Here's another invitation. This is Jesus. Come to me, all you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. Weariness, being burdened, that's soul thirst. That's not human thirst, that's soul thirst. Listen, um, take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart, and you'll find rest for your souls, for my yoke is easy and my burden is light. I just, I just read two powerful invitations to those who are weary in soul. That those are what, that's what we need to hear. We need to hear God's invitation because something happens to us when we're weary and when our soul is sick. Something happens to us. We want to crawl 
away someplace and hide. If we're not careful, we will start to think the wrong things. We will think God does not care about us. By the way, the, the psalmist in Psalm 42 reflects a little bit of that, doesn't he? Where are you? When can I meet with you? And yet, there's still a desire there. Invitations to the soul, the weary soul, the hungry soul, the thirsty soul. Now listen, to be yoked to the world will only and always weary and trouble our soul. Amen, Pastor Peter. That is so true. I've experienced in my own life over and over again. You see, at some point, you and I have got to look and say, how long am I going to do this? How long, when my soul is thirsty, am I going to think a vacation will cure it? How long, when I'm weary of working in my job and it's not satisfying, will I think if I could only get a better job that makes more money, I will be satisfied? How long are we going to keep thinking, I am so discouraged with some of the broken relationships in my life. If I could just find the right people who understand and love me, I would be satisfied. Now the problem with that is there are no right people. I, ha I have to stand before you and I have to say what we all know is true. If you're going to trust me to be the lover of your soul and the person that can satisfy you, you're in for a big disappointment. It ain't going to work. My wife's not here this morning, but ask her. She'll tell you. It won't work. That one does not work. That one does not fly. We've all tried it. Imperfect people looking for imperfect people to live and love them perfectly doesn't work. Because God has reserved to be the God of your salvation and my salvation and nobody else. We know that's true, but why does it take us so long to learn it? Why do I keep doing these same things only to get to the bottom and have to realize again, wait a minute, this is back to start. I got to go back to the beginning, which is when I trusted God and found him responding to me. Folks, what I'm talking to you about today, it's the hardest thing for every one of us to keep consistent in our lives. Hardest thing. Hardest thing is keeping the main thing the main thing. And the main thing is my reliance is on the love and the care and the salvation of the God who made me and the God who searched for me and the God who came to me and the God who invited me and revealed himself to me. And he's the only one that's ever healed my soul. And that's why he deserves to be praised when I'm up when I'm down, when I'm in the middle, I need to remember the times when he led me, let me lead the procession of multitudes to worship him. And I need to remember when I was in the back of the crowds when the multitude went to worship him and their worship lifted me because they believed what I knew was true, but at the moment didn't feel was it, that it was true at all. John chapter 4, the woman at the well. So we talked about three weeks ago, invitation. Last week, two weeks ago, invitation. Last week, JB talked about the woman at the well. Now listen, Jesus goes out of his way, goes to Samaria to find a woman with a broken, damaged, sinful soul, but she was thirsty. It was this woman's thirst, not her righteousness, that caused Jesus to go to a people he was not called to 
at that time. To go to a woman who was rejected even by her own townspeople and the people she lived with. And he goes to her, and do you know what he does? He asks her for something. He starts the conversation. He asks for a drink. If you haven't read John 4 in a while, go back and read John 4. It's just a beautiful, beautiful chapter. He asks her for a drink. He tells her, after they converse, and most of the conversation is she's, she's pretty much confused and pushing away from the truth of what he's saying. And he asks her, that he says to her, if she would ask him, listen to this, if she would ask him, he would give her living water and she would never. Do you remember her answer? Her answer is very selfish. Her answer is very needy. Her answer is very confused. She desires this living water so she will no longer have to go to the well and carry the water home. And after they talk some more and Jesus says, go get your husband, I don't have a husband, you speak rightly. And Jesus basically, he does what I say, what I call, read her mail. He reads her mail. Jesus, with his insight, looks at her heart, starts to talk to her about her life, and reads her mail. And her response is, oh, sir, I perceive that you are a prophet. And she says the most awesome thing. Listen to it. Here's what she says. This confused, needy, lost, rejected woman, this Samaritan that Jesus is talking to, you know what she says? She says, well, I know you Jews say to worship here, and we say you worship here. And, but then she says this. She says, apart from all the, the argument, she goes, I know that the Messiah is coming. And when he comes, he'll explain everything to us. What an amazing statement. You see, this woman had hope. She was confused. She was broken. Her soul was so damaged, people could not stand to even associate with her. But somewhere down inside, her thirsty soul had heard about a Savior. And Jesus, in that moment, because of her thirst, because of some degree of honesty in her. You know what he says? He reveals himself to her. He says, I who speak to you am he. Jesus proclaims to her, he is the Messiah. Revelation. You see, first God invites, and then if we accept the invitation, and I want to tell you, I believe this is true every single time, if God's people, when he invites us, when God says to you, come aside with me, I need to give you more than what you currently have. I want to move you on to a deeper place of knowing who I am and knowing who you are. When God says that to us, if we'll accept the revelation, it is if we'll accept the invitation, it's not just that God comes and fills us and so we get what we want. It's that God comes and fills us and shows us something more about who Christ the Savior is. And every time God shows you or I more about who the Savior is and we believe who he is, we see more of his nature, we are enlarged geometrically from what we knew before. I think if you'll examine your life, you will find that there are places where you heard something in the Word, or God whispered something to you, or you heard a teaching, or in a moment of need, the way God solved your need was to show you who He was, and all of a sudden, that revelation spoke to you perhaps for years. In fact, if you'll if you'll brush the dust off of that revelation, when God showed you who he was, when God showed you what he can do, when God showed you his plan, when God showed you how he loves you, when God showed you how he'll never leave you, if you dust off those things and remember what he did, you'll find that you can still eat 
from that truth and it will quench your thirst and it will fill your stomach like nothing else because God is a God who builds one revelation of his salvation after another after another after that's how he builds his people that's why the Spirit of God is so important that's why Jesus talks about living water referring to the Spirit which was yet to be given okay God always extends the invitation to come to us, to, to come to him. If we come, if we seek, it's God's desire to give us a revelation of his salvation. So had I taught this as a three-part uh, series, it would have been invitation, revelation, realization. And realization is where we are today. We've got to understand why God invites. We've got to understand that if we respond to his invitation, what it's really all about is, it's, it's, it is about me, but it's not so much about me. It's really about more of him in me. And that's what I mean when I say revelation. So I want to go back to Psalm 42. Hopefully you're still there. And I want to talk a little bit about the realization that we can gather and garner from the psalmist that is here. I'm going to start in verse 5. And I want you to do your best to identify with what the psalmist is saying. So listen. Why are you downcast, O my soul? Why so disturbed within me? Can I stop for a minute and ask you a question? Who's the psalmist talking to? Who's he talking to? Talking to himself. Talking to his own soul. Okay? Why are you so downcast, O oh my soul? Why so disturbed within me? Can, can I tell you the truth? This can happen even if everything around you looks wonderful. Even if all the circumstances are good and your health is good and everything seems good, you can find a soul hunger that can make you feel just like this. Why so downcast on my soul? You, you, ever, you ever wake up or you ever realize in the middle of a day at some point in time you go, man, my outlook is really down. It is not positive. You know, I felt pretty good yesterday, but today, it's like, and you know what? It's not physical. And you know what? It's not circumstantial. And you know what? What in the world? That's what he's talking about. And he's asking the question. And though it's directed to him, I believe he's asking the question of the God who made him. And I believe it's great instruction for us. If we will realize that when we have spiritual hunger or what I've so called a thirsty soul when my soul is thirsty if I will realize hey I'm not living whole right now I'm not living joyful right now there's something missing right now and then go no further don't consider what's missing embrace the fact that you need more of God that if there's anything missing it's that you and I need another invitation another revelation another realization that we're not yet what we will be that we're not there yet we haven't arrived yet we're still in the process and God is at work with us why so disturbed within me put your hope in God for I will yet praise him my Savior and my God now he repeats my soul is downcast within me therefore I will remember you from the land of Jordan and he talks about something different my soul is down I'm thirsty but I'm gonna remember what you are like on the heights of her you ever you ever just walk away and go my gosh why am I so needy why every day do I have needs in my soul he says put your hope in God praise God remember God there are deep places in you that you cannot touch 
but let those deep places call out to the deepness of God. Let God be the one that makes the connection by His Spirit to your spirit on the inside. You and I don't need to figure it out. In fact, I have come to believe my testimony would be this. The harder I work at figuring this out, the more I labor at trying to be right, the more I sweat and bleed and do my best to get to where God wants me to be, the fewer are the results. But the more that I trust God and be at peace, the more that I find God meets me, the more that I find God advances me. Our salvation is not in the work that we do, it's in the work that He has done. Amen, Pastor Peter, that is really good. We should shout, but we're stuck in the work. We're stuck seeing the places in us that don't function. And can I say something to you? It's just sin. just our flesh. Pastor, are you making light of it? I'm not making light of it. I'm saying this psalmist has a deep realization about the fact that his soul on this earth will not always be filled, but that there's one who will invite him back to the table, who will reveal more to him and who will fill him again if he'll put his hope in that one, if he'll trust that one, if he'll listen. You know, there's a verse that I've come to love of late. Are you ready for it? Be still and know that I am God. You see, there's all kind of good activity. How many of you like to be involved with good activity? How many of you like to accomplish things? How many of you see yourself as goal-oriented? How many of you think that to be a good contributing human being, you've got to be aimed at things, and you've got to accomplish things, and you've got to get them done? And there is some satisfaction in all those things. But that is not the real satisfaction. The real satisfaction is, I belong to the God who made me. That's the real satisfaction. I belong to the God who made me. And because he showed me who his son is, I believe that my God has forgiven my sins. He's washed them away. And because he's washed them away, he's come near to me. And he loves me. And his son says, I'll never leave you and I'll never forsake you. A little bit more. Listen to this, verse 9. Listen to the contradiction in verse 9. This is our contradiction. If you feel like when I read it, raising your hand and saying, yep, that's my contradiction, you have permission. I say to God, my rock, why have you forgotten me? Why must I go about mourning, oppressed by the enemy? My bones suffer more life. Now listen to this. Do you hear the contradiction? I say to God, my rock, you're the rock of my salvation. You're the one that never moves. You're the foundation of my whole life. I say to God, my rock, why did you leave me? That's a complete contradiction. It's truth on the one hand. His spirit is speaking truth. I say to God, how did you get the right to even talk to God, your rock? Where'd that come from? So there's truth in the spirit. I say to God, my rock. And then total contradiction. Why have you forsaken me? Well, how can you talk to him if he's forsaken you? Why would you be writing a psalm to sing in church if you think he's forsaken you? It's a feeling. It's a negativity. It's a wondering. How often when bad circumstances come upon us do we say, where'd God go? How often in our current world are we saying, has God forsaken us? Hmm. Verse 
and our foes say, where is your God? Can I say something to you about that? I very seldom had people come and say to me when I'm in this place, where is your God? Almost never. You know who my real foe is? That's right, right here. The person who says to me, where's your God, is me. We are our worst enemy. Do you realize that we have got, how many of you know, we've got enemies? We got enemies, okay? The world, the flesh, and the devil. But listen to me for a moment. Here's what Jesus says. Be of good cheer. I've overcome the world. Right? Okay, so the world is actually a defeated enemy. Treat it like it's a defeated enemy. Don't be yoked to the world. Be yoked to the Savior. That's how we win against the world. It's actually not complex. How about the devil? Do you know the devil has been defeated since God threw him out of heaven many years ago with his third of the angelic host? Now, I understand the devil has some little range of movement, and I'm going to say it that way. I, I'm not one to promote the devil. I am not one to say, oh, wow, the devil has so much power. No, actually, he doesn't. He has very little power. The devil's power is imaginary. It's thought. It's feelings. It's accusation. The power of the devil is that he's a liar. That, that's his power. He has already been defeated. He does not have a heavenly realm to operate in. He only has an earthly realm to operate in, and one day that too will be gone. So if Jesus defeated the world, and if God has already put down the devil and vastly limited his playing field, then what's our real problem? Real problem's my flesh. Okay? And it is not that, oh gosh, I can't stop myself from doing certain things. That's probably true at some level. But the real problem with our flesh, are you listening? You got to hear this. Real problem with my flesh is, when I desperately need to believe in the God who said he'd never leave me, when I desperately need to believe in the God who said the work I started with you, I will finish with you, when I desperately need to believe in my God who said, by your faith, you are healed, by your faith, your sins are forgiven, by your faith, you are a son of God, you are a daughter of God, you will rule and reign with me down through all of eternity. When I desperately need to believe those things, my flesh drags its feet and says, no. And that is our biggest problem. And then we make it worse. We say, why am I like this all the time? Oh my gosh, I must be the worst Christian in the world. No one else goes through these problems. Everybody goes through these problems. We just don't talk about it. Everybody goes through these problems. And when real trouble, real trouble really comes our way, and some of you have gone through real trouble. You live long enough, you all go through real trouble. That's the human condition. The human condition is full of death, it's full of disappointments, but there is one who can lift our soul and free us from the negativity of our own flesh our own enemy. Okay, so here's the realization I hear the psalmist making. Here's the realization I would love for us to make. I cannot fill my own soul. You good with that? I added something in parenthesis for myself, although I try. 
I cannot. I wish I could say that because I realize I can't fill my own soul and only God can fill my soul, only God can satisfy me, I wish I could say, therefore, I never try. But the flesh is real. I can't fill my own soul, although I try. So the key becomes to understand when I'm trying and when it's not the Lord filling, it's me trying. Any good theologian would call that works. Any good theologian would call that idea works. I feel better about myself when I work towards salvation than I feel about myself when I simply receive salvation by faith. The greatest enemy is that I think I can fill myself. My times of defeat find me saying that God has left me that I will always be needy and unfulfilled and left alone. These are all lies. And we need to realize that they are lies. The psalmist does realize it. I want to finish with another psalm. This is a psalm of David, Psalm 63. And if you're a Bible scholar, I'm going to read the first few verses of Psalm 63. Uh, If you, from the notes that we have and can look at, it appears, how many of you remember when Absalom rebelled against King David and David had to flee Jerusalem and go out into the desert of Judah to escape Absalom, to escape being put to death, think about this, by his own son. It appears that this is when David wrote this psalm. Listen. O God, You are my God. Earnestly I seek you. My soul thirsts for you. My body longs for you. In a dry and weary land where there is no water. I've seen you in the sanctuary. And beheld your power and your glory. Because your love is better than life. My lips will glorify you. I will praise you as long as I live, and in your name I will lift up my hands. My soul will be satisfied as with the richest of foods. With singing lips, my mouth will praise you. I'd like the worship team to come back at this point in time. David is in real trouble when he writes this. It's not imaginary. It's genuine. It's true. Do you ever wonder why the Bible seems to go out of its way to show us that every great hero that's in the Bible, every person that God said he delighted and he blessed and he loved, had flaws? David, David was a great man of God, received a great promise from God. Many flaws in David's life. Many flaws. And the Bible doesn't skate around them. (laughs) The Bible just puts them out there. And God remains true to his promises to all his men and women in spite of their flaws. And God will remain true to you in spite of your flaws. Jesus said to the woman at the well, if you would ask me for a drink, I would give you living water and you would never thirst again. Jesus said in John chapter 7, remember, he stands up on the last and the greatest day of the feast. The last and the greatest day of the feast. And in a loud voice he says, is anybody thirsty? Let him come to me, and out of your innermost being shall flow rivers of living water. What God wants to do is not just for us, but it is for others through us. We cannot give what God has given unless we let him fill us. It's not enough to give people ourselves. We give ourselves to the God who made us. 
And he fills us with himself. And we give him out to others. Invitation when we're in need. Invitation. If we respond to the invitation, God will reveal himself to us. Out of revelation, we end up with realization that we're in the midst of a personal battle, but one that God has already provided for, one that God has already won for us, and one that we must walk in faith with him in. Let's stand together and worship.